By internet security, I mean we want to secure our communications when we're using applications in the internet. We've spent some time going through one very common example of uh, secure communications in the internet, and that was HTTPS, secure web browsing. But web browsing is just one application in the internet. There are many other applications that don't use HTTP, but we still want to secure. Tell me some applications in the internet that don't use web browsing or don't use HTTP. What's one application? FTP, so file transfer. You contact with an FTP client, an FTP server to download files. Normally, unsecure. The files are downloaded in the clear. What's another application? An application we use in the internet. An application or a protocol. SMTP. Why would you? Would you? We, uh, why would we use SMTP? For what application? Sending messages, and those messages we call emails. All right. SMTP is a protocol used for email. So email is an application that, of course, doesn't necessarily use HTTP. It uses SMTP, IMAP, POP, and other protocols. Some others? Instant messaging, so LINE, uh, WhatsApp, and all those applications. And, and in the old days, MSN and all those applications that allow instantaneous communications don't necessarily use HTTP, they may use their own protocols, so that between the applications they communicate with their own protocols. Instant messaging, voice applications, talking to someone across the internet, game applications, your game client talks to a game server, not necessarily using HTTP but its own protocol. Uh, many business applications, so many companies will have their applications developed for them that talk between clients and servers. So when we talk about internet security, we don't just care about web security, but also the security of other applications. The problem is that most of those applications we just mentioned in the original design did not have any security mechanisms. FTP does not secure any data. SMTP for email does not encrypt the emails. Most game applications by default would not use any security. But if we want security, we need some extra features. That's what we'll mention here. So many of the internet protocols were designed assuming that the network is trustworthy. We can trust the people running the devices. We can trust the people who access the links. And that was true when the internet started maybe 40 years ago, because it was just for communication between academics, researchers. But of course, as it grew, and more people used it, and especially for commercial services, there started to be malicious users involved, and you could no longer trust the links. Maybe someone intercepted data on a link, so we needed some security mechanisms. But none of those original protocols had any built-in IP, does not encrypt the IP datagram. TCP does not de encrypt the, the data in the segment, nor does UDP. We know HTTP has no security mechanisms. Email and many other protocols which we commonly use and still use do not have inbuilt security. So what happened is as, as the internet grew and people realized we need some security mechanisms, they often added some extensions, some optional extras to those protocols. For example, for IP, there's an extension called IPsec that you could use to encrypt your IP datagrams. With TCP, there's an extension called Transport Layer Security, TLS, again used to encrypt an, your TCP packets. And for SMTP and other applications, there are extensions to encrypt emails and, and the different types of data traffic. What we'll do in this topic very briefly is compare the, the, the approaches for where we can use these extensions to provide security. And we'll look at it from a layered perspective. 
And we'll look at four, four approaches. As when we use a normal internet stack, using an application layer, transport layer, network, data link, and physical, we'll look at, well, where could we add this security extension? At which layer? And we'll cover four cases of application, transport, network, and link layer. And we'll compare the advantages and disadvantages of using each. To compare them and to illustrate them, we'll use this uh, simple example topology and, and set of stacks for devices. So let's explain it first. This is an example where let's say host A wants to communicate with host B on the internet. How would host A identify host B on the internet? What would host A need to, to identify host B? Any idea? You've all spent last semester studying networking, another course, or two courses this semester. How do we identify hosts on the internet? IP addresses. So we assume that host A and host B have IP addresses. And host A has an application running that wants to communicate with an application on host B. We assume that host A knows the IP address of host B. And we'll look at the devices in detail in a moment. But in this scenario, let's say we've got a case where host A, say my laptop, uses Wi-Fi to talk to a wireless LAN access point, like the device at the back of the room. So there's a wireless link here. Then that Wi-Fi access point has a LAN cable plugged into it. And that LAN cable goes eventually into a router. If we consider SIT, it's my laptop wirelessly connected the access point in the back of the room and then a LAN cable coming from that access point into a router maybe downstairs on the third floor, our computer center in this building. And that router, router X in this diagram, has a cable going into another router, maybe a router at Rungsit campus. And that has a cable going into another router that covers TU and it keeps going and that forms our internet or our routers connected together. And eventually, let's say our host B is in another country, we get to router Y. So note where I draw between router X and router Y, I say the internet. There may be many other devices in between. We just simplify by drawing there two, but there may be multiple in between. And eventually, router Y has a cable going into host B some server computer somewhere else in the internet. And that, so that's our topology for this example. And we'll assume A and B want to communicate. The applications want to communicate. And they want to communicate securely. So we'll talk about what security they can provide. Now if we look in the details of the devices, what are the five layers from top to bottom? First layer at the top, what's the name? Top layer. Application, second layer. T, T, T. -t. The layer name. Transport, then third layer. Network, fourth layer. D, there's a hint there. DL, data link. And at the bottom, physical layer. Okay, so there are our five general layers to simplify our devices. So in this diagram I show the stacks for our example devices in the topology. Sometimes I give specific technologies at those layers, sometimes I don't give the details. So let's see. So our host A at the application layer has some application layer protocol. What are some examples of the application layer protocol that we could use here? Yell them out and I'll write some down. What could we use as an application layer protocol? Tell me one example. 
Anyone? It's all right. We have four lectures. I can wait. Uh, we can even have a makeup lecture if we need. Maybe Thursday next week on our holiday. One application layer protocol. A again? <laughs> Almost. You got the first letter, did you? What's the obvious one we use? HTTP. So SMTP for email. Uh, we have also for email, we have things like POP. You don't need to write these down, just giving an example. So IMAP for email, you may have seen them configured. Uh, instant messaging applications often have their own protocol. An old one, there was MSN, when, when you use Windows Instant Messenger uh, was a protocol. There are many voice protocols, voice over IP, and many, many other application level protocols. For this example, we're not being specific. We're saying we've got some application level protocol that wants to talk to this one. It may be our own. Maybe you've been tasked to write an application for a company that communicates with a server and you define your own protocol. At the transport layer, I've given the two common ones. At the transport layer, we primarily use TCP. Sometimes we use UDP. There are a few others which are very infrequently used. TCP primarily used because we need reliability in many applications, and TCP provides reliability. UDP is very simple and mainly used for uh, real-time applications, multimedia applications like streaming, streaming video and voice. So that's the transport layer. At the network layer, we center around IP, the internet protocol. At the data link layer, what are some examples? Or for this host A, what standard or protocol is used at the data link layer? My laptop, host A. What technology am I using to communicate at the data link layer? There's a hint on the picture. At the data link layer for my host A, the, the laptop in this case, what technology am I using to communicate across the link? Yeah, it's something about the network interface card. What am I using? What, my, what is my network interface card uh, using to communicate? What's the common name or the official name of that technology? <laughs> Start with a simple name. Well, the general name, Wireless LAN, what's the more common name? Wi-Fi, wi sometimes we call it. It's the marketing name for Wireless LAN technologies, Wi-Fi. The actual standard is referred as IEEE 802.11. So that's the, the standard that defines the protocol to use at the data link layer. And also at the physical layer. So there's a standard for Wi-Fi they define how do you communicate at the physical and data link layer. On this picture, I don't show their names. I just say data link and physical, but we assume that it's a Wi-Fi technology, IEEE 802.11. The access point on the left interface. Those at the back look at the access point. How many interfaces does it have in use? How many? Give me a number. How many interfaces do you think it has in use? Maybe. Zero, one, two, or three. Everyone in the class. That access point, everyone can see. You've got four options. Zero, one, two, or three. How many interfaces are in use now? Zero. Hands up. OK, good. One. One interface. A few people, so everyone else thinks two or three, all right? Those were wrong, so here's your chance to be correct. Two interfaces, hands up. 
All right, we've got one, two correct people, and one put her hand up just after everyone else did. Three interfaces? No. So the answer is two. Why two? Ethernet and Wi-Fi. If you look closely, there's the, the two antennas providing the wireless access. Plus, if you look very closely, there's an Ethernet cable plugged into it. Is there? You see it's attached to the wall, I think, there, an Ethernet cable. OK, so there are two interfaces using a Wi-Fi access point. We have the Wi-Fi interface, the wireless LAN interface, on our picture on the left side. And on the right side, the wired interface, the Ethernet interface. The answer is here, too. So that device implements two sets of data link physical layer pairs. There's a data link and physical layer protocol for communicating across the wireless, the Wi-Fi technology, and a separate one for communicating across the Ethernet uh, link. So that's why I draw in the stack that there's a data link layer and the physical layer for Wi-Fi and, and similar here. Bridge just means that's the, the term for how they, those two are connected together. That's the role of the access point. Similar for the routers. This router X has an Ethernet cable plugged in, so it has a data link layer and physical layer for Ethernet, and another data link layer and physical layer for the other cable. And in this diagram, we don't specify what the technology is in this other cable. Maybe it's ADSL, maybe it's uh, Ethernet, it's an optical fiber technology, we don't know. We don't really care in this example. But importantly, that router implements IP. Because in a router, this is the device that's connecting our internal network to outside. So just be careful, the Wi-Fi access point does not implement IP in this case. It is not a router. Sometimes we may refer to it as a wireless router, but the way that it's used in the SIT is simply as an access point where it receives a Wi-Fi packet and sends it to the real router using Ethernet. And subsequent routers across the internet all involved in the IP forwarding process. And then we receive at host B, which is identical to host A. Before we get onto the security part, where are these layers implemented? Starting from the bottom. Where would you find the implementation of the physical layer? You have your laptop, your Apple Mac. Don't be embarrassed for using an Apple computer. It's all right. So where is the physical layer implemented in your computer? It's somewhere in there. All those layers are somewhere. If your host A is somewhere in your computer, where are they? Where's the physical layer? If I ask you, find me where the source code or the hardware is of the physical layer, where would you point me to? Specifically, name the, the part of your laptop that implements the physical layer. Or for your phone. Anyone can help her? I think we know that the bottom layers, the physical layer is about getting signals out, and even the data link layer is about getting the data across a link. They usually go together, and a general name may be a network interface card. It's the hardware that provides that technology. Say, in your laptop's case, it's the Wi-Fi chip. So if you open up your laptop, you look inside and, and on board the motherboard, there'll be a chip which is for implements Wi-Fi. It actually implements the physical layer and the data link layer. So usually it's a separate chip on, side the, on the motherboard or in some old computers, it would be in a USB device you'd plug into your laptop. That would implement the physical and data link layer. In general, we refer to that as a network interface card sometimes. But here, we'll denote that the bottom two layers are commonly in, in hardware. I'll just say HW, that's 
usually a hardware implementation. We have a device embedded in our computer that does that, sometimes called a network interface card. Where's IP in your laptop? Where is it? Where is the software? IP is a protocol. It's implemented, and he, or I've given you the part of the answer. It's implemented as software, not hardware. Whereas the Wi-Fi technologies, data link layer and physical layer, implemented in hardware normally as a, on a as code on a chip. IP is implemented as just some software. Maybe someone wrote some code and compiled it to get the IP software. Where would you find that software on your laptop? Or how did it get there? How did it get on there? That's how you get your IP address from DHCP, but the IP software that not just handles the IP address, but when you get an IP packet, looks at it and sends it on, where is that code or, or the, the executable that does that? Where would you find it in your computer? We need to know this so we can compare the different solutions. Did anyone install something called IP? when you installed your computer. Do you remember installing a piece of software called the Internet Protocol? Probably not. So trust me, it's there. If you can use the Internet, there is some software for IP on your computer. How did it get there? When did you install the IP software? Or what did it come with? Did it come with Firefox when you installed that? Did it come with the Line application when you installed that on your phone? No, no. So what did it come with? What else do you think? The driver, sometimes you install drivers. Why? <coughs> for the network interface card normally, the drivers. The drivers are really just a way for interfacing the, the software to the hardware. So no, it's not in the drivers. There's one other big piece of software on our computer. What's the name of that software that runs our computer? You've had a whole subject on it. Your operating system. When you installed, or when someone installed Android on your phone, maybe not you, when the, the supplier, or you installed the OS X on your laptop, or you installed Windows or Linux or whatever operating system you have, one part of the operating system is the IP software. It's not normally installed by independ independently by you. It usually comes as a feature of the operating system. As does the transport layer. The same with TCP and UDP. There's some additional software that implements TCP, and that also comes with your OS. So it's important to distinguish that we have a rough split here that your OS covers these two layers. These two layers, data link and physical layer, are part of the network interface card and implemented in hardware. We often use drivers. Is the name of the software that allows our operating system to interface with the hardware. So sometimes you buy a new network interface card and it doesn't work. So you need to update or install the drivers which allow your OS to talk to that new piece of hardware. The OS includes the software for IP, TCP, UDP, and other protocols in these layers. Where do the application protocols, where are they implemented? Well, in the application themselves, usually. You install your web browser, Part of the code of the web browser implements HTTP. You install Line. Part of the code of Line implements the protocol that Line uses to talk to the server. So the application layer protocols come with the application that you install. This has a 
the separation here between application OS and hardware has an impact upon how convenient it is to use some different security solutions. Which one is it easiest for you to modify? On your computer or on someone else's computer, which one's easiest to modify? Application, OS, or hardware? Application. Can you modify the hardware? Well, not very easily can you program the hardware. Usually you need a lot of resources to do that. Sometimes, can you modify the operating system? You can change the settings. Can you change the source code of your operating system? Get it to do something else? With Windows, probably not. With Linux, you could, because it's open source. You could find the source code change and recompile, but it's not easy. All right, so we don't normally change the operating system functionality. We may change settings. The application, we could. Many applications, if we have access to the source code, it's not so hard to modify, recompile, and now we have a, a modified application. So that has an impact on where we may implement the security mechanisms. So that's about our layered stacks. Now let's use this example topology and looking at the individual devices and see where we can implement the different security mechanisms. And the first approach, the general approach, we'll refer to as application level security. What I mean by that is that the security mechanisms are implemented in the applications. So we want to communicate securely from host A to host B. The application on host A includes some source code which implements our security mechanisms. What security mechanisms? Well, the one obvious thing, encryption. I have some data to send from host A to host B. We need to encrypt that. So the application includes some code to encrypt data. How could we write some code to encrypt data? What would you do? What algorithm could you use to encrypt data? From some of our very first lectures, what are some algorithms or ciphers we can use to encrypt data? AES is one, a symmetric key cipher. RSA is a public key cipher. Normally for data, we use a symmetric key cipher. AES, there are others as well. So you're, if you're an application developer, what you could do is implement the source code for AES and include it in your application. Let's say you want to create a new uh, alternative to LINE or an instant messaging application. And it needs to talk from host A to host B and you want it to be secure communications. So what you could do is implement your application, the graphical user interface, all the functionality, plus have a feature that encrypts everything that you send, encrypts every message. That's what we mean by application layer security. The security mechanisms are included in the application. Not just encryption, but if we're going to use AES, What's another thing we need to do? How do we get a key from A to B? You can't expect the users sometimes to, to type in the key at computer A and the key at computer B. There are techniques for exchanging keys securely across the network. Handling certificates, for example. So not just encryption, but other security mechanisms, checking hash, uh, checksums or hashes or uh, message authentication is all implemented in the application. Now, what I show in this picture, this red line, is saying if we implement our security mechanisms in the application, both at host A and host B, the user generates some data. The application has that data and this, I denote the AppSec block, this functionality, say, encrypts that data and then sends that data to the transport layer. 
And what is sent to the transport layer is encrypted. So from a packet perspective, the packet, we can say, has Here's my packet that's created by the application. It contains some data and an application layer header. So just a shorthand for the packet structure, the packet format, two blocks here. But what the application does is it sends that to the transport layer, TCP or UDP, depending on what the application needs, and it can send that encrypted to the transport layer. So what TCP does, for example, the transport layer may attach a header. I'll say we use TCP in this example. And we have the inside the TCP packet, the application layer header and the data, but all of that is encrypted. So I'm trying to show the packet formats. We can draw them as rectangles at the different layers in our stack. The application generates some data to send to host B. The application encrypts that packet, sends it to TCP, if we're using TCP as an example, or alternatively UDP, and from TCP's perspective, it attaches a header, follows its protocol rules, but everything inside the TCP packet is encrypted because the application security block encrypted it before it's sent to TCP. TCP sends all of that to IP. So the IP datagram has an IP header a TCP header, the application layer header, and some data. But still, the application layer header and data are encrypted. That IP datagram is sent to the data link layer, your Wi-Fi card, which attaches a header and eventually sends it across the Wi-Fi link. So we'll just draw that at the bottom, the packet that's sent. I'll not draw the data link layer and physical layer separately. I'll just denote them as Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi header, IP, TCP, but the application layer header and data are still encrypted. So this is the structure of the packet sent across our wireless link from my laptop to the access point. Any questions on what I'm drawing there and why I drew it that way? We want to see what is encrypted. If, if we're using encryption for our data, what gets encrypted and we'll compare it to some other approaches. If someone intercepts that packet, I send it from my laptop to the access point, you're running your laptop and you're running some software to capture the wireless packets, you intercept it, what can you see? What could you learn from intercepting this packet?
what would you learn if you saw that packet using TCP dump and Wireshark, for example? What would you learn or what would you not learn from intercepting that packet? What would you not learn? Data. You would not learn the data. The data of the application is encrypted. You would not learn the application layer header, okay, because that is also encrypted. So that's the idea here. Nothing about that is revealed to a, someone who intercepts because it's encrypted. But what do you learn in this case? What could be useful for an attacker if you intercept this packet? Any ideas? Have a look at the packet. Look at what's encrypted and what's not. What could you learn from the unencrypted information? Look what's unencrypted and what could the attacker learn from that? Just look at the packet. Look what fields are unencrypted. Can you know the IP address? Yes, the IP address is in the IP header. There's a source and a destination address field. The IP header is not encrypted here. So an attacker knows who sent it and knows who received it. So that is not kept confidential. It's only the data inside that's kept confidential. What else can be learned? Does the attacker know the type of application being used? You capture this packet and I ask you, tell me the type of application being used. Can you find the answer? You say, no, why not? Because the application layer is, header is encrypted, but there's another way. How would you find the type of application? Don't worry about your other courses. You worry about passing this course. <laughs> this is my last semester at SIT, so I can make the exam as hard as I like <laughs> and give as many Fs as I like as well. So the question, how would you determine the application type? The IP tells you about the computers communicating. What can tell you about the application type? What other type of address do we have that tells us something about applications? How would you know if a packet belongs is going to a web server? Port number 80. So port numbers, server port numbers, commonly identify the type of application. And where is the port number stored? It's stored in the TCP header. So there would be a destination port number in the TCP header if the destination port number was 80, I would know this is for web browsing. If it was for port number 25, I know that's for an email server. And I generally can find out, given a port number, what type of application it is. So we don't necessarily hide that, but we do hide the data in the application. This packet is sent across the internet in the normal way that IP packets are sent across the internet. The source address, let's be detailed here, the source address in the IP header identifies host A, the IP address of host A, and the destination identifies B. And the source port would identify the application here, whichever one we're using and the destination port would identify the application at B, let's say the server application. That is revealed to anyone who intercepts along the way. But at any point between host A and host B, at any point along this red line, if someone intercepts this packet, they cannot see the application layer header or the data. So this is a good form of security, and it's called end-to-end -end security, or host-to-host -host security, because between the two endpoints, the two hosts, everything is encrypted all along the way. We'll see some alternatives where it's not the case. 
So that's an advantage of using application security. A disadvantage is that the person who created the application must also implement the security mechanisms. Again, coming back to an example, you, you have a new idea to create an instant messaging application, an alternative to Line. You develop it for your mobile phone or for Android, and you decide to use application layer security. So then it's your responsibility to implement those security mechanisms. So if you implement AES and it works, good. But if you maybe make a mistake in your code and AES is insecure, then your whole application is insecure. So one of the disadvantages of application security is that it's the responsibility of the application developer to implement those security mechanisms. And it's very hard to get them correct. So it's very easy to make mistakes and lead to flaws. If you don't want to implement them yourself, what could you do? You don't want to implement AES or RSA, what could you do as a software developer? Any ideas? I give you a homework task to implement an application which imp encrypts data. What approach could you use to make your life easy? If you don't want to implement AES yourself, you could go and find some library or some framework that already implements it for you and use their code. And that's common that there are many libraries available that will implement different encryption algorithms. So you could use someone else's code and hopefully someone else's code has been tested a lot and is found to be secure under as many cases as possible. So that's a more common approach. You don't implement it yourself. You use a well-known uh, library to implement the security mechanisms. So application le level security is the first approach we can use to secure our communications in the internet. Some examples. Secure shell, which I think you've used to log into other computers, is an example of application level security. It's implemented in the application. If you want to have security mechanisms for email, you can add uh, enable features that encrypt your email messages, open PGP, SMIME, are examples of application level security. DNSSEC is for DNS, securing DNS. And there are others as well for many different applications. The very good thing about application level security is it provides encryption from the source host all the way through to the destination host. We don't depend upon the operating system. Right? Our application security mechanisms aren't depend upon the security mechanisms of the operating system. So it should be possible to implement for different operating systems. The problem is that each application must implement security mechanisms. For example, every application that does this must implement AES. I develop my new instant messaging application and implement AES myself. You do a different application, and then you go and re-implement AES. So it seems to be a waste of resources to have every different application to implement the same encryption cipher. And there's a high chance of making mistakes when you implement that cipher. So that's the first approach. The next approach, rather than have the application developer implement the security mechanisms, leave it to the operating system. And let the oper operating system implement AES, RSA and others, and the application simply use those features. And the first way, way that we do that is using transport level security. And there are, there's a protocol that we use for transport level security commonly called TLS, which actually means transport level security. And the old name was Secure Sockets Layer, SSL. So in this example, slightly different. We want encryption from application to application 
Instead of doing it inside the application, we do it inside the transport layer. And the distinguishing point here is the transport layer is inside the operating system. Remember that where the, the split between the OS was, here's the application, here's the OS. Here's the hardware. We drew this before. So the first approach implements security mechanisms in your application. The second approach use the operating system provided security mechanisms. Therefore, you don't need to do it as the application developer. And a very common way that that's used, when we use TCP as a transport protocol, the protocol available is TLS, or also called SSL. Very similar to before. We will not draw the entire packet but the application may have a header and data and then TCP attaches its header what is encrypted here again it's what the application sends to TCP so in fact all of it can be encrypted which is the same structure as with application level security. So very similar here. The main difference is where are the security mechanisms implemented, either in the application or in this case the operating system. TCP passes it to IP and the same packet is sent across the wireless LAN. Actually, maybe I've drawn that slightly wrong and I will not fix it here. I missed out something here. We add in another header. To be precise. What we do inside our Wi-Fi packet, we have our normal IP datagram inside that, a TCP datagram or segment, but we introduce a new header for the specific protocol being used here, TLS in particular, and that is not encrypted. And then we have the application header and data encrypted inside that. So it's slightly different from the previous case, but the same information is encrypted. Still the application information is encrypted, Still, an attacker knows the source IP and the destination IP, source A, destination B. They know the protocol, the port number. So they can still see whether it's going to destination port 80, port 25, or some other port, and identify the type of application. So that's similar to the previous case. So very similar to application level security, the key difference is that in this case we don't need to implement the security mechanisms like AES, RSA, certificate verification. We let the operating system do that. Or even if it's not included in the operating system, we let a, a separate piece of software that implements TLS do that. What are some implementations of TLS? 
Name me one. And this is an easy exam, exam question to, to answer. TLS. One implementation of TLS or Secure Sockets Layer is the old name, SSL. Name me the, the, the program or the code that implements it. You've used it before. You've used it in some homeworks. Note that TLS is the, the name of the transport layer security used by TCP. The old name was SSL, Secure Sockets Layer. What's the name of, a, of an implementation of them? Can you remember your homeworks? Maybe before, maybe one of the first or the second ones. What command line program did you use to generate keys? What was it called? Gen P key was the option, but the, the, the word before that option was what? Open SSL. Right? The software you used in your homeworks was OpenSSL. OpenSSL is just an implementation of SSL. SSL is the old name, TLS is the new name, that's all. So OpenSSL is some software that implements TLS. So what we would do, you write your normal application, you don't implement RSA, AES, you don't care about certificates, you then communicate with OpenSSL, which does all the security stuff for you. And then OpenSSL sends to TCP, which is part of the operating system. So there are some common or, or widely used implementations of transport layer security. OpenSSL is one of them. In Windows, Windows provides something called S-Channel. In Mac, the OS X provides I think it's called Secure Transport, is the name of the software. There's GNU TLS and there are some other implementations of transport layer security. So there are some widely used ones. The important thing is that the application developer doesn't have to deal with those implementations. They just use someone else's. So again, we have end-to-end -end security or host-to-host -host security, that's good. We have host-to-host -host encryption. It makes applications easier and application development easier. The application developer doesn't have to worry about the encryption or the implementation of it. Someone else does it for them. Less chance for them making mistakes and leading to security flaws. The problem is that usually the transport layer security only works for one transport protocol. TLS works just for TCP. If you want to use UDP, you need a separate solution. There's DTLS, but it's not so widely used now yet. So it's only specific for uh, transport protocols. Your applications must be modified to use these uh, features in the operating system. So if your application did not use security, but now you want it to use security, you'll need to change some of the, the code in your application to support those security features, which is not too ha hard nowadays. So this is a good solution, and the examples of where it's used for TCP-based applications, the name of the technology is TLS or SSL, and we know HTTPS. HTTPS is simply HTTP using TLS. And there's similar ones for IMAP, for email, for FTP, file transfer. They're just the normal protocols, IMAP and FTP, but they use the transport layer security and for, for SMTP and others. This is a widely used solution uh, for web browsing, of course, HTTPS, but also some other applications. Both are very similar with respect to security, but differ with respect to how easy it is to develop the application. Using transport layer security is generally easier. Let's consider a third approach, network level security. 
at the network layer, in particular with IP, we encrypt the IP datagrams and send them encrypted across the internet. So your application doesn't do anything special for security. TCP doesn't have to do anything special or UDP. But when the data gets to IP, IP uses an extra feature called IPsec that it encrypts the datagram and then it's sent across the internet and then received at host B. So let's draw that and see how that compares to the previous two. I will not draw the entire packet, I'll draw uh, the, each layer will draw the final packet in this case. We have the Wi-Fi header added by the data link layer and, and combined with the physical layer. And we have a special, we have the IP header. And we also include IPsec in there, uh, introduce a new header. Then the normal TCP, the application layer header, and the data. This is the packet sent across our wireless link, as an example. And one approach is that we encrypt everything from the transport layer up. This is all encrypted. So the source address is still computer A. The destination IP address is still computer B. But what other security have we provided here that the other two didn't? What have we encrypted that we didn't encrypt with the previous two solutions? And what c do we hide from an attacker? What's hidden from the attacker in this case? Compared to this one, what's different? The port numbers are hidden. That is, the TCP header, or the transport layer header, is encrypted. And inside that is the source port and destination port. So if someone intercepts this packet, they don't know whether it's going to a web server, an email server, instant messaging uh, program, or whatever. They can't see the port numbers. And that provides some additional confidentiality that maybe is useful in some cases. They just know it's an IP packet. They don't know what's inside. So that's a, a one difference between the, this IPsec and the previous systems. Still the application data is encrypted. We still have end-to-end -end encryption. If we're using IPsec on host A and host B, then anywhere in between, they cannot see the transport layer header application or data. What's the problem with this? So good security compared to the other two, or, or good security similar to the other two, end-to-end -end security, even a little bit more in that the transport layer is encrypted, so a, a little bit better than the other two. Why is it not so good? Does anyone use IPsec? IPsec, look in your phone and go to VPN settings. Yeah, I think you'll find your VPN settings on your phone. Find VPN settings. And there should be some options for how to set up the VPN. Maybe add a new configuration. Down the bottom? 
what can you choose from? What types of EPNs? PPTP? What else? You can choose from PPTP, the type, L2TP, and IPSEC are the main ones. There's slight variations. So I think if you look into the details of your VPN connections on your phone, usually both Android and, and iOS, they allow you to choose between three main approaches. One's called PPTP, one's called L2TP, and the other's called IPSEC. Do you see IPSEC? Yeah. Okay, so have you ever used it? No, not many of us use IPSEC. It is widely used if you want to use a VPN. Uh, but we haven't talked about VPNs just yet. We will. Uh, but it's not commonly used for end-to-end -end encryption in this case. The reason being, set up your VPN. What do you need to do? What are all the things you need to fill in when you set up the VPN? You don't know how to set up the VPN because for most users, there's some detailed technical information that you need to provide. So the problem with IPsec is the end user, the user of the computer, needs to do some manual configuration. And that's hard for many people. Everyone in this class, I know you can set it up. But in the general population, asking them to set up IPsec is complex. It's hard to get them to do that. Whereas with the previous two solutions, with transport layer security, and application level security, it was automatic. The end user didn't have to do anything to set it up. And that's a big problem with IPsec. IPsec works for all applications and all transport protocols. It doesn't matter, TCP, UDP, HTTP, uh, a line application, anything. It works for all of them. It can be used host to host from one endpoint to another, which is good. But the main problem, it requires some manual configuration, usually in the operating system. As you see on your phone, when you go to the VPN settings and IPsec, you need to enter in some details. Same if you wanted to use IPsec on your computer, you need to set it up some details. But with transport layer security and application level security, you don't need to configure anything. It just works. So it's not so widely used. At least it's not widely used for host-to-host -host encryption. As you see, it's on your phone under VPN settings. It's used in VPNs, which is in a different mode called tunneling mode. But VPNs, tunneling, we'll cover next week and we'll see how they relate to privacy as well. So these other two variations of IPsec we'll cover when we look at VPNs and tunneling. We'll finish today with one last example. So we'll come back to tunneling and, uh, and VPNs. The last example is link level security. You do the encryption just across a single link. And a common one that we use is Wi-Fi encryption. So it's not supported in SIT, but if you've got a home Wi-Fi access point, you should be using it. There are different variations of Wi-Fi encryption. One of them is called Wi-Fi protected access. I think version two. So WPA2 is usually the setting you want to choose. There's an older one called WEP, W-E-P, which is insecure, but WPA is the recommended one. Of course, link level encryption applies just across a link. For example, with Wi-Fi encryption, all of the data sent from your laptop to the access point would be encrypted. If we draw our packet. So this was IPsec. The entire TCP packet was encrypted. If we consider as an example of link level encryption, WPA or Wi-Fi encryption, what's encrypted?
We have the Wi-Fi header. It actually has some WPA options. We have the IP header. TCP, for example, application and data. That's our original packet. The encryption happens in uh, it performed by the Wi-Fi network interface card. So what's encrypted is all of the data passed to the Wi-Fi layer. All of this. So this is sent from host A to the access point. The IP header is encrypted. Someone who intercepts this doesn't know about host B. We know the IP header will include the source address of A and the destination address of B, but since it's encrypted, someone who intercepts this packet cannot see those addresses. So that's the additional level of security this provides. But the problem being is it's only applicable for this link. Once your access, points re access point receives this packet, it decrypts and sends the original packet across the next link with no encryption. So what is sent across the Ethernet link and the other links in this topology from the access point to the router, from router X to the next one, and eventually from router Y to host B, the packet looks like this. The header here may be Wi-Fi, Ethernet, it, it may be different values, but nothing's encrypted. The red line finishes here. And that's the main problem with link level encryption. It applies just to one link. If we want to be secure from host A to host B, we must use link level encryption across the Wi-Fi link, and across the next Ethernet link, and across the next link, and across all links in the path. For that to work, we must trust everyone in the path as well. We must trust the devices, because the access point decrypts the data and then encrypts again across the second link. So we must trust the access point not to intercept our data. So the problem with link level encryption is we don't have end-to-end -end or host-to-host -host encryption. Does anyone use Wi-Fi encryption? At home, maybe, use WPA on an access point or in some Wi-Fi access points. Anyone used it? Hands up. One person, so everyone else fails, two. Surely you've used it in some cases. Especially if you set up your own access point at home, you should have it turned on. Why? If it doesn't provide end-to-end -end encryption, what's the benefit here? So someone on the internet can still intercept your packet. So what, why would you use it? The benefit is that, in practice, it's very, very easy for someone to intercept a packet sent across Wi-Fi. It's very easy for someone to sit outside of your room and use their laptop to intercept the packets which you're sending to the Wi-Fi access point. It's much harder for someone to intercept the packets sent from your access point to your router because it's across a cable and that cable's in your room. They need to physically come into your room and attach to that cable to intercept. But with Wi-Fi, because of the broadcast nature, it's easy for someone to be remote and to intercept. So that's why it's important to use encryption across wireless links, because it's much, much easier for someone to intercept. They don't need physical access to the link. So it's recommended to use uh, WPA, especially for Wi-Fi access points. But not suitable if you want encryption from host to host. We would generally combine that with one of the other solutions. So 
WP is an example of link level encryption. Bluetooth has encryption, other wireless technologies as well. GSM has encryption and, and, and 3G technologies. It applies to everything sent across the link, but it only applies across that link. That's the problem. And it requires some configuration of both endpoints. If you do set up Wi-Fi encryption, you need to program in a password at your laptop and your access point. So it requires some manual configuration. What we'll do in the next lecture is we'll come back to tunneling uh, IPsec and we'll see what on your mobile phone the VPN option means and we'll talk about that in this topic and also the next topic on internet privacy.